And good evening. Tonight, nearly half the country facing down a frigid fall blast. 25 states under threat of freezing temperatures. Those alerts affecting more than 86 million Americans from Texas all the way up through Vermont. Temperatures expected to plummet overnight to record lows. That winter system already slamming the Midwest. Take a look with more than a foot of snow. The storm knocking out power for thousands of customers in Michigan and Wisconsin. In Fort Wayne, Indiana, winds and dense Winds and dense, heavy snow pulling down trees and power lines. Some streets impassable. As far south as Campbell County, Tennessee, though, look at this. Well, that looks like a lot of snow there. <laughs> snow dusting the roads as temperatures fell below freezing. And it's those cold temperatures that will cause the biggest issues heading into tonight. Al Roker will bring you that forecast in a moment. But we begin with N NBC's Maggie Vespa, who leads us off from Michigan. Tonight, millions of Americans are getting a chilling reality. Winter is coming. I've never seen anything like this. This is super early. In Michigan's Upper Peninsula, residents facing over a foot of heavy, wet snow, knocking out power and canceling classes. The first snow day of the school year. But my daughter was so excited when she came out of bed. Yes! There's no school. That cold front also bringing lake effect snow to Indiana, knocking down leaf filled trees in the south. Snow even dusting neighborhoods in Kentucky and Tennessee, covering up near peak fall foliage as this front continues to move east. This area sucks. <laughs> Time to move somewhere warm. 86 million Americans will be under freeze alerts this evening. Many forced to scramble to find their winter jackets. I had to dig them out, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Look more than the closet. Yeah, the last week I had to top down, and uh, <laughs> this week, well, it's a different story. Across the state, at least 28,000 without power as wind gusts have topped 60 miles per hour. Well, in recent years, it seems more like mountain weather around here. Very extreme. Countless families forced to crank the heat just as heating bills are expected to hit a 10 year high, leaving some left to wonder whether this unseasonably severe cold snap is a sign of brutal winter weather to come. Is any part of this painful given that we're like mid October? Um, it's going to be a long winter, <laughs> a really long winter starting this early. Here in Nagani, Michigan, people we spoke with thought the calendar skipped from October straight to December. This was like Christmas, not Halloween, like trick or treat or Merry Christmas. Like, like that's what you would think right now. Like pick a lane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The best way to fight this brutal cold, a warm outlook. All right, that's one way to fight it. Maggie Vespa joins us now from Nagani, Michigan, part of that hard hit Upper Peninsula. Maggie, the early timing of this stone made, made the impact that much worse. Yeah, Tom, exactly. So utility crews out here in the UP basically reportedly are finding a lot of downed trees that hadn't shed their leaves yet, meaning they were likely toppled by snow because this early in the fall, they're that much heavier. Tom? And, and Maggie, you know, seeing these pictures in your story, it's sort of hard to believe that we're in fall and it looks like the snow is still falling where you are yeah. right now. Are there any hopes that the snow will melt quickly and, and people can get back to their fall weather? Yeah, yeah. Long story short, the end is inside. I know you saw some of our earlier live shots. The snow is tapering off actually quite a bit from like this or this morning and sort of mid afternoon. And basically it's expected to wrap up overnight. Cold temperatures stick around for a few more days. But this is insane. By the end of the week, we're expected to be up in the 60s in this part of the country. So again, the end is in sight. The question people would love an answer to that they won't get for quite some time is, is this a sign of more brutal winter weather to come? Tom, we'll see. Maggie Vespa leading us off tonight here on Top Story. Maggie, we thank you. For more on the forecast, Al Roker joins me now in studio. And Al, where are we seeing those record low temperatures right now? It's a wide swath, Tom. In fact, right now we're looking at that pesky system where Maggie has been dealing with. That's going to finally move out and the snow will end. But we've got the cold still hanging in here. 86 million people stretching from the plains all the way into the northeast and as far south as the Gulf Coast. Jet stream way down to the south. We look for possibility of 18 states setting records. 23, 24 25 in Wichita, 25 in Patuka, Raleigh, 34, Tallahassee, 39, very close to their record, New Orleans, 46. Now, tomorrow, those temperatures, again, way below where they should be. Cincinnati, 53 degrees. That's 13 degrees colder than normal. Baton Rouge, 64, 15 degrees cooler. Philadelphia, into the low 50s. That's 11 degrees cooler. This is going to moderate over the next couple of days into the weekend. And then, good news, if you're in the eastern half of the country, next week, temperatures warmer than average, but if you're 
you're out west, it's going to be a little chilly for you out there. Tom? So cold in so many parts of the country. All right, Al, thank you for that. We take you now to Ohio, where a plane crashed into a car lot this morning, killing both people on board. The explosion starting a huge fire. NBC's Maya Eaglin has this story. Tonight, officials investigating a fiery plane crash in Ohio. We just had an explosion of some sort out here towards Walmart. Black smoke sounds like an airplane. Authorities confirming the plane's occupants, a pilot and a passenger, were killed. It's going to be a matter of investigating, you know, trying to figure out what exactly happened, and that's where the FAA and the NTSB comes into play to assist. The plane, a 1974 Beechcraft King Air E90, crashed into a car dealership in Marietta shortly after 7 a.m. Luckily, no one on the ground was hurt. Got multiple cars on fire, multiple cars on fire. Eyewitnesses described seeing big black smoke and hearing what sounded like, quote, little explosions after it crashed. Officials identified the occupants as 45-year-old Eric Sievers and 49-year-old Timothy Gifford, a retired firefighter. Both had pilot licenses, but it's not yet clear who was flying the plane. Their families have been notified. What we're going to look at is where they were coming from, where they were headed. Uh, if there were any issues with the v with the aircraft prior to the crash, uh, any radio traffic that may have been heard. The Federal Aviation Administration and the National Transportation Safety Board are on site and investigating. The plane left from John Glenn International Airport in Columbus shortly after 6.30 a.m. Our affiliate WTAP confirmed with a spokesman it was headed to the Mid-Ohio Valley Airport in Wood County, West Virginia. It looks to me by the course and the tracking that they were being vectored, radar vectored, for an approach to runway 21. Something happened within 22 seconds that caused that airplane to fall out of the sky. At that point, it's pure speculation what it might be. Experts say the twin-engine plane, which can carry up to 10 people, is a very reliable aircraft. It's a sophisticated airplane. Um, it, it's It's a great utility airplane for small corporate flight departments, but it's a very reliable airplane. The crash also shut down a highway for several hours. The car dealership says about 15 cars in the lot were damaged and their building is slightly scorched. But authorities say the damage could have been much worse. All right, Maya Eaglin joins us now in studio. So Maya, investigators may have some challenges as they try to investigate this crash, why? Right, so lesser aviation expert says there was no voice recorder and no flight data tracker on the actual plane. And usually those are the first indicators of what happens before a plane goes down. Yeah, and I know you have some new reporting on, on small plane crashes because they happen more often than people may think. Yeah, they happen way more often, obviously, than commercial flights. We know that this year there have been 325 small plane incidents, and of those, 158 were fatal. 262 people died from that. Thankfully, no commercial crashes, um, but these numbers have steadily been going up. Maya Eaglin for us tonight. Maya, we thank you for that. We want to turn now to a story we've been following here on Top Story. The alleged Stockton serial killer appearing in court for the first time today. The man suspected of killing six men and wounding one woman in a series of shootings in Northern California. Now charged, though, with three counts of murder. He was arrested Saturday driving through the city armed with a handgun. For more on the latest in this case, Steve Patterson joins us now from Los Angeles. And Steve, this is the first time we're actually getting a look at the murder suspect here while he was in court. The suspect, 43-year-old Wesley Brownlee, he's been charged, as we mentioned, with three counts of murder, along with being a felon in possession of a firearm and in possession of ammunition. But he's accused of killing six people here. So why only charges in three of those cases? That is the question, right? Why only three counts when there are six victims? Well, the district attorney has said almost from minute one that we should expect additional charges beyond what we hear today. And a lot of that has to do with simply the evidence lagging behind the court, so to speak. They wanted this guy off the street on what they could get him on, but there is still more evidence that needs to be processed, including some crucial ballistic evidence. When that comes down, prosecutors say we should expect more charges and possibly maybe even more enhancements on top of those charges and maybe even capital charges on top of that. But all of that to follow. That's what we're hearing. And, and Steve, you know, these killings have shaken Northern California. Have authorities yeah. said anything about a motive in this case? 
No, and that's what's so frustrating about these cases, Tom. You know, there just simply isn't a pattern. There were uh, different genders to the people he allegedly targeted, different races, different ages, different locations. The only thing that's really consistent is the style in which he took aim, which was in the cover of darkness, at night, in dark places around parks, and the fact that, you know, according to prosecutors, that he wanted to kill as many people as possible, which is so terrifying to hear. But as far as an actual motive. We may not hear more about that until a trial, but even with that, in some of these cases, we may never learn what this guy was thinking. Tom? Steve Patterson from Los Angeles for us. Steve, we appreciate it. Turning now to another major headline, a French company with operations all over the U.S. agreed to plead guilty today to supporting terrorists who killed Americans. Officials say it's the first U.S. prosecution of a company for supporting terrorism and that that company made a, quote, deal with the devil. Here's justice correspondent Ken Delaney with the details. One of the world's largest corporations admitting tonight it funneled millions of dollars to ISIS. Corporate crime that has reached a new low and a very dark place. French cement company Lafarge, which operates plants in dozens of countries and 43 U.S. states, pleading guilty to paying terrorists in Syria between 2013 and 2014 so it could keep a cement plant running as ISIS and other groups fought for control. Payments made at the same time the terror group was capturing and beheading U.S. hostages, including James Foley and Stephen Sotloff. Prosecutors say the company sent ISIS and the al-Qaeda-linked Nusra Front more than $10 million, then tried to cover it up. Lafarge made a deal with the devil. Foreign terrorists who pledged to, and in fact did, harm the United States, its people, and its national security. The company agreeing to pay a settlement of nearly $800 million to the U.S. government. French authorities in 2018 charged eight former Lafarge executives with financing terrorism. The company, now owned by a Swiss firm, said today it deeply regretted what happened, adding that the executives involved no longer worked there and that none of the conduct involved U.S. employees. In a disturbing twist, Tom, court documents show Lafarge was doing business with ISIS and al-Qaeda at the same time its concrete was being used to build One World Trade Center on the site where terrorists destroyed the Twin Towers in 2001. Tom? Ken Delaney for us from Washington. Ken, we thank you. Now to a major verdict today, a federal jury acquitting Russian analyst Igor Dechenko on four counts of lying to the FBI. The case likely the final chapter of special counsel John Durham's probe into how the FBI investigated allegations of collusion between former President Trump's 2016 campaign and Russia. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas joins us now live on set. Danny, I, I just, when this headline came out, I, it was confusing to a lot of people because now you have yet someone else who was not guilty and so much time and effort put onto this on both sides. What happened in this case? In this case, for Danchenko, what happened was the FBI or the government accused him of false statements, essentially. This case was on the ropes almost from the beginning. The judge dismissed one of the charges based on the use of the word talk. It was alleged that Danchenko had talked to an FBI agent. But the judge read the dictionary definition of talk and concluded that emails wouldn't count. So that count was out of there. And of course, the jury isn't told why a count is dismissed, but they know that it is dismissed. And they're in real time seeing, oh, this case is literally falling apart as we're sitting here. And so from there, uh, really, the defense did something that may surprise a lot of folks. They didn't put on a defense. Now, a lot of people say, well, why would you do that? Well, that's because the government has the burden. And this is a classic case where you don't need to put on a defense because they alleged that there were conversations, that, there were, that uh, the defendant lied about having conversations. But they left out the possibility of things like WhatsApp, uh, other, other methods of communicating. And they, with that big of a hole, the defendant could say, hey, the only thing they pulled were these kinds of communications. There are all these other kinds of communications that they didn't put evidence on of to even show that I could have talked to this person. It may have been true that I spoke to this person and that I wasn't lying about talking to that person. So, and to remind our viewers, Dechenko was one of the sources for the Steele dossier. A lot of fabrications there, obviously, but it led to so many other things that have affected this country over the last four years. Years. A special prosecutor was appointed here, John Durham. Durham. What, what, what has happened to him and, and what has happened to his case? Because he's been investigating this for a long time. 
consider this. Most of the charges he could bring are now approaching the usual federal statute of limitations, say five years. But it's been some time. So it's likely this is the end of any charges. The next thing that we'll expect is a report for him to issue uh, based on his investigation. He is a special counsel. But consider that there are two, three trials. One ended in a guilty plea. Two ended in acquittals. Now, when you consider that the federal government's conviction rate hovers around 95 percent, one in three or 33 percent is not a good batting average for this or any federal prosecutor. So it kind of tells the tale about this investigation in full. And Danny, this is a complicated question, but I want to see if you can walk us through it. When people ask you what happened, how, how is nobody in jail, how, how, did, how did all these investigations happen? If you think about going back to Robert Mueller, investigating the Trump campaign, to now investigating the group that, that alleged, that, that started the Steele dossier and everything else, and, and yet it, we, don't, we don't really have people in prison serving hard time for any of these connections. There were people that made mistakes, that lied to the FBI, that got caught. Some of those people did get prosecuted. But when you think about everything we've gone through and this country has gone through since the first allegation started, what, what do you tell people? Think about the money and resources that were invested in this investigation. That's what I think about any time I see a special counsel appointed, whether it be Mueller or whether it be Durham. Uh, that is because they are usually appointed for some political reason. And at the end of it, maybe you get a hundred page or a couple hundred page report like the Mueller report. Right. Maybe you'll get one like that in the Durham case. And when you're holding the four corners of that report in your hand as a citizen, you have to ask yourself, was this all worth it? This publishing, this book that I now hold in my hand, was this worth all the resources that were expended? And it really is ultimately, the answer to that question is a political one. Let me ask you, has there been any type of smoking gun that people can say this is a smoking gun in the Durham investigation, the one we just had right now, about the origins of the Steele dossier and, and the allegations of Russia collusion. Has there been a smoking gun there yet so far? I don't know that we've learned anything, certainly not from these acquittals, because remember, no. these acquittals really occupy a narrow space. Essentially, the government here was charging these defendants with giving false statements. And those false statements to uh, government officials were in response to an investigation. In other words, and look, I'm a defense attorney, I'm biased, yeah. but these kinds of charges are created by the government when they go to somebody's office and ask them questions. Prior to the investigation, the crime often doesn't exist. It only exists by virtue of them going and talking to somebody, a subject or a, a witness, and then they believe that witness is lying to them, then they charge that witness. And that's really a challenging thing to bring. A lot of folks end up pleading guilty to federal charges, but history shows that fighting these, these false statements charges, you have a shot at winning. Most of the time in federal court, you've got very little shot of winning. Danny Savalas, we always appreciate your analysis. Thanks for coming on tonight. Next, countdown to the midterms, which are now just three weeks away. Those key races heating up as candidates hit the debate stage, battling it out on issues from abortion to the economy. Peter Alexander has the latest on some of those critical contests. <laughs> With just three weeks until the midterms and Republicans slamming Democrats over the economy and record inflation, President Biden tonight trying to amplify the politically divisive issue of abortion rights, urging voters to keep Democrats in control of Congress. Here's the promise I make to you and the American people. The first bill that I will send to the Congress will be to codify Roe v. Wade. But some Democrats fear the potency of that message may be waning. Tonight, a new poll shows 44 percent of likely voters cite the economy or inflation as the number one problem facing the country, while just 5 percent list abortion as their top issue. And now Republicans have a four-point lead when voters are asked which party's candidate they'd support. In Ohio, one of several crucial races that will determine control of the Senate, Republican candidate J.D. Vance hammered Democrat Tim Ryan over skyrocketing prices in a heated final debate. That rising energy price that people see at the pump, that they see in the utility bills, that was the direct result of policies enacted by Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and supported 100 percent by Tim Ryan. While Ryan slammed Vance for embracing former President Trump. You were calling Trump. America's Hitler. Then you kissed his ass. It's not true. It is true. And then you kissed his ass, and then he endorsed you. And you said he's the greatest president of all time. There are critical governor's races, too, in the battlegrounds of Arizona and Michigan, and a rematch in Georgia between Republican Governor Brian Kemp and Democrat Stacey Abrams. Their one and only showdown last night. We live in a state of fear. 
And this is a governor who, for the last four years, has beat his chest but delivered very little for most Georgians. Kemp touting his early moves to reopen the state during the pandemic and going after Abrams. Miss Abrams is going to lie about my record because she doesn't want to talk about her own. All right, Peter joins us now from the White House. Peter, I want to go back to that intense debate in Georgia last night. Where do polls have the race now between Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp? Tom, our best snapshot is from an average of recent polls, and it shows that the Republican Governor Brian Kemp is leading Stacey Abrams by about six points, roughly 50 percent to 44 percent. But if neither one of these candidates gets more than 50 percent in the midterm next uh, month, they're going to have to have a runoff coming up in December, Tom. And we know the president is crisscrossing the country right now trying to tout his records. He's expected to pivot to the economy tomorrow with a focus on gas prices. I know you have some new reporting on this. Yeah, that's right. So in an effort to lower those prices, the president, we were told, is going to announce that the administration will move forward with the release of as many as 15 million additional barrels of oil from what's called the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. It's a controversial move, and it comes after Saudi Arabia snubbed the president's request recently to boost oil production. Tom. All right, Peter Alexander with some new reporting from the White House. Peter, thank you. We want to head overseas to Russia. Thousands of young men are actually fleeing the country to avoid being drafted to fight in Ukraine. Our Keir Simmons traveled to neighboring Kazakhstan and spoke to some of those men who have fled Russia. Tonight, as Russia's President Putin attempts to force Ukrainians into capitulation with deadly drone strikes, he's under pressure at home, with many Russian men deciding to leave. We traveled to Kazakhstan to meet some of the thousands who came here to escape the partial draft. I don't want to kill people. I don't want to die. With their possessions on their back, these men not wanting their faces on camera. This is the bag that you left Russia with? Yeah. Just this? Yeah. Dmitry, not his real name, is homeless and heartbroken. I feel very sad about it because I feel a connection with my motherland. You love your country? Of course. Of course I love. I love Russia. We met a group of Russian artists putting on street performances as a thank you to the people of Kazakhstan for welcoming them. Alexander's friend got his draft papers and they decided to leave that same day, just grab anything they could. And what happened on the border? We flew, then found a car, he says, but there was 10 miles of traffic at the border, so we walked, no longer facing life on the front line, but their lives changed forever. What do you see in the future? I can tell you nothing about my future because I see, like, only in two weeks. Back in Russia, the only independent pollster here tells us support for President Putin remains strong. But the partial mobilization is having an impact. More than half of the population feel anxious about it. What are they anxious about? Uh, that uh, their, their husbands, their sons might uh, be recruited. The Kremlin says the partial draft will soon be over, with 300,000 enlisted. But ultimately, it's President Putin's decision. Tom? All right, we're back now with two horrifying bear attacks in Connecticut, a neighbor saving a young child from the animal's jaws. And across the country, two college students coming face to face with a grizzly living to tell the story. Here's NBC's Nyla Charles. Kind of tackled me and chewed me up a little bit. A Wyoming student mauled by a grizzly bear. The scars on his face proof of the heroic lengths he took to save his best friend. I'm glad all four of us walked off that mountain. Brady Lowry and Kendall Cummings were searching for antlers shed by deer in Wyoming with their college wrestling teammates when a grizzly bear charged Brady. The big bear looks scary, mean, Dude. teeth drooling, <laughs> breath stank. It bit me on the arm and shook me around through me. Coming sprung into action, using his own body as bait so the bear would attack him instead. That's when it got my head and cheek. Giving Lowry just enough time to run to his teammates and call 911. The Parks County Sheriff's Office says the students were picked up by Good Samaritans and taken to first responders who evacuated them. Both Cummings and Lowry now recovering at the hospital side by side. Save my son's life. The Wyoming incident, not the only bear attack last weekend. I just threw the pipe as hard as I could. I hit the bear right in the head 
and it was enough to back him off. In Connecticut, Jonathan Digamus says he hit a 250-pound bear with a steel pipe when it grabbed a 10-year-old next door, saving the boy. I have seen bears before, but never one that was that aggressive. The Department of Energy and Environmental Protection says the black bear was euthanized and the 10-year-old boy got away with minor injuries. It's hard to talk about because with my kids and everything, I couldn't imagine. The attacks, a gruesome warning of what can happen when man becomes prey, but also a reminder of what happens when people come together. I don't think anyone else lesser than a wrestling team with the bond we have, they wouldn't have handled it as well as we did. All right, Nyla joins us now. Nyla, I want to go back to that case in Connecticut first. Do we know why that bear attacked that little boy? Tom, the boy was attacked in his backyard. The Department of Energy and Environmental Protection tell us black bears in particular are normally shy, but a growing number of them are becoming comfortable around homes in their search for human food, which explains the bear attack in Connecticut. But overall, bear attacks are rare. Tom? Yeah, we, definitely rare, but but a good warning and a reminder that they are a, a, out there. Before you go, I do want to ask you about that wrestling team. That that one wrestler, the, the young man who, who had his face mauled, do we know what his recovery is going to look like? No word yet on what that recovery process looks like, but so far he looks to be in good spirits and happy about the outcome. He, It's really impressive how he was willing to risk his own life to save his friend. Tom? Yeah, incredible. They all survived there. Okay, Nyla, we appreciate it. When we come back, the dire economic warning. Some experts now saying there's a 100% chance of a recession in the next year. You heard that right. A 100% chance. The steps you can take now to protect your savings and maybe even your job. Stay with us. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed and an update tonight. Police have arrested a person of interest in the gruesome killing of four men in Oklahoma. Authorities say Joseph Kennedy was taken into custody near Daytona Beach, more than 1,000 miles from where the victim's remains were found. Kennedy was driving a car st stolen near the crime scene at the time of his arrest. So far, he has not been charged with the four murders, but is facing charges for a 2012 shooting back in Oklahoma. Fast-moving wildfire forcing evacuations in Washington state. The Nakia Creek fire exploding over the last several days, growing from just over 500 acres to more than 1,500. The fire just 5% contained. Thousands of residents in Clark County forced to evacuate, and officials now searching for the driver of this light-colored Subaru, which they say was parked near the ridge where all that fire started. Okay, now to the Boy Scout troop rescued after several days stuck in a New Mexico forest. New aerial footage shows a helicopter crew spotting the group of nine adults and 16 children inside the Gila National Forest. The troop from Texas was supposed to be on a week-long camping trip but could not leave after heavy rain caused a river to rise there. Bad weather also delayed the rescue about 17 hours. Luckily, no one was hurt and everyone was airlifted to safety. And a new study finding one in five Americans are forced to ration insulin. This happened last year. The report published in the internal medicine documents finding roughly 1.3 million Americans with diabetes either skipped, delayed, or used less insulin than necessary in order to save money. Insulin costs an average of five to 10 times more in the U.S. than in other countries. Doctors warn rationing insulin can be dangerous and in some cases, deadly. Okay, we want to turn now to money talks. With three weeks to go until the midterms, Bloomberg economists issued a possible blow to Democrats. The economists predicting a 100% chance of a recession by October 2023. This as inflation remains near its four-decade high and the Fed pursues aggressive rate hikes to get it under control. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung now joins us live here on Top Story. So, Brian, data is in your title. What, what, <laughs> what? What was the data that Bloomberg saw that they issued the stark warning? I mean, 100% recession, they're going all in. Yeah, and market's up right now, but look, they're shaking off these concerns of a recession. Broadly speaking, the expectation is that things might get worse before they get any better. As you mentioned, that survey from Bloomberg noting that they're using their own proprietary model, looking at a number of different things to say that there could be a recession happening very soon. This lines up with other anecdotal things that we've been hearing. You have the conference board, for example. They polled a bunch of CEOs. 98% of them said they also expect a recession. But keep in mind, the actual agency, the group 
group that's in charge of officially declaring recessions, the National Bureau of Economic Research, the NBER, has let yes to do so. They're assessing things on a number of different criteria beyond just the standard definition you may have heard on the street of two negative quarters of uh, economic contraction in this country. Keep in mind, employment is still at 3.5 percent. That level of unemployment is at multi-decade lows. They might want to wait until they see unemployment go up before they declare a recession. But either way, the projections from Wall Street, from Main Street, pointing to a recession not happening long, long from now, Tom. So high inflation, you also have, um, you know, these predictions that a recession may be happening, but yet the market on top today, right? Yeah, we're, sho the green? we're showing the numbers today. Again, uh, S&P 500 and the Dow Jones ending the day up about 1%. A lot of this is because of earnings that we got over the past few days. Yesterday was a big day for earnings. So was Friday of last week. The big banks reporting, they seem to show that Americans still have a lot of spending power, specifically with credit cards. We heard from Netflix just a few hours ago. They beat subscriber ads. So the companies, the corporate picture doesn't necessarily show signs of a recession. That'd be a reason why Wall Street is bouncing back. But again, Wall Street, not the economy, just because it's green today, doesn't mean that we're shaking off those recession fears. Always now. a good reminder. Then finally, Brian, the California, I think it was the Association of Realtors announcing today that existing home sales in September down 30 percent. That's a crazy number. What's going on with the housing market in our country's largest state? Yeah, really interesting data we saw today. The number of single family homes fell and the median price for those homes are falling. Keep in mind, we're seeing a lot of decompressure uh, happening in specifically the markets of San Francisco and San Jose. It could be because a lot of those were uh, San Diego, rather, because they got a lot of inflow during the pandemic time. But it's interesting to see this is happening nationally as well. Keep in mind, we have the S&P case Schiller read on home prices in the month of July. That was a bit of lag data, but they're also showing deceleration across all of the major cities in the United States. We'll have to see if that trend continues. Not necessarily a surprise, because if you want to try to buy a house now, you're looking at mortgage rates above 7 percent. Pretty eye popping, which is discouraging a lot of potential home buyers, Tom. Yeah, a lot of markets, so still no inventory. All right, Brian Chung, always great to have you. Appreciate it. With a growing chorus of economists warning of a recession, Microsoft is confirming it's laid off nearly 1,000 employees the second round of personnel cuts this year as it warns of slowing revenue growth. Kristen Myers joins us now on set. She's editor-in-chief of The Balance. Kristen, what should consumers expect, you think, in the coming year? And, and, and how can consumers get ready if this recession hits over the next 12 months? Yeah, so we've essentially heard from Jay Powell, right, chair of the Fed, who says that we're going to expect a lot of economic pain going forward. So if you are someone who wants to buy a house, we just heard from Brian, right, those mortgage rates right now are 7% they're going to get higher. If you are someone who has debt, maybe credit card debt, the interest rate on that debt is going to get higher. And then, of course, you have job instability as a possibility. As you're mentioning, Microsoft having layoffs. We're hearing other companies either saying, we're going to have to start making some cutbacks in terms of our employee ranks, or we're actually going to start doing hiring freezes. So if you're someone who is looking for a job, you might find it a little bit harder going I, I want to ask you about that in a moment. But first, for younger investors, say people who are employed, want to contribute to their 401k, heading to, into a recession, should they pull back on that? Or should they try to buy stocks at, at possibly a value? Yeah, no, do not pull back right now. If you're not someone who's particularly worried and you have a pretty robust emergency savings and you can continue to contribute to your savings, this is actually a really great time to honestly take advantage. We have a couple of economic downturns in our life when you are young, and truly this is an area where you can have a lot of wealth be made. If you're an older investor, that's when you really start to get worried. If you're in the age range of 61 to maybe 71, that's like the fragile decade when a recession happens, then you really need to start making some considerations with your investments. Yeah, and the only way to get that company match, a lot of companies offer the match, is to actually buy. Um, for older investors, people who may be close to retirement, or maybe they're in retirement right now, and they're hearing the R word, they're hearing recession, what should they do? Okay, so first of all, don't panic, never panic. Uh, so when it comes to retirement, if you're in retirement age, Here's a couple of good pieces of news for you. One, recessions usually freak people out so much because they're afraid of losing their job, but you're already retired. So job loss is not something that you necessarily have to worry about. This is going to be a time and recessions do not last forever. This is a time for you really to reconsider maybe some assets that you have in your portfolio, maybe switch over to some more defensive stocks. That's food, health care, for example, utilities. But then you also maybe want to cut back on some of your spending so you're not really bleeding through the retirement that you have. If you're about to retire, this is maybe a time to consider. Is this something I'm going to have to retire early? You really want to start increasing those savings. So you mentioned jobs, right? And, and we're, we're at a point right now where employees have so much freedom. They also have a lot of leveraging power as well that, that 
kind of, the kind of power I've never seen in my li lifetime. We know in, in some cases that's sort of ending. What can people expect as, the, as we enter a recession? Will more of those freedoms go away? Will jobs be lost? Will people not be able to jump around as much as maybe they want to? So recessions typically include higher levels of unemployment. So there is probably some job loss that is going to be inevitable. That doesn't mean that everyone needs to worry that they're going to lose their jobs. We still have no idea when this recession will hit and most importantly, how bad it's going to be. We've heard mild recession really being bandied about. You don't need to worry that necessarily 2008 is absolutely going to repeat itself. Now, when it comes to those jobs, if you are a worker, that leverage is absolutely declining. So if you haven't if you haven't found a job that you want yet, you probably want to get in now. If you haven't secured a raise, you're probably going to want to get that now because we're definitely going to see some of that leverage go away as the power starts to shift back towards the employer's hands. Have we come down to maybe the reason or is there an explanation? Because you talk to small businesses and they're still looking for workers. And I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying as we possibly enter a recession that you got to be careful. You, maybe you can't be as selective. And if you're looking for a job, try to get one now. But, but people are still having such a tough time finding good, good workers to stay with them. Yeah, so this has been really the big million dollar question throughout this entire pandemic. We have jobs, there. we know there's workers out right. there, why can't we fill them? And frankly, we're just frank hearing from a lot of employees saying, I don't want to do that job. Even if that was the job I had previously, this is a time where I really start to wanna make some shifts in my life. The pandemic really upended how people were approaching work and even how they were considering salaries and other benefits. And that's really where we're starting to see some of this disconnect happen. And, and Kristen, finally, because I'm having such a great time talking to you here, we're getting such great information. People looking to buy a car, maybe lease a car, people looking to rent a new home, rent a new apartment. As we enter possibly a recession, how are all those things going to get more complicated or are they going to get easier? Things like cars, very expensive right now. We know rents in a lot of cases are still going up. Yeah, so conventional wisdom says when you're about to go into a recession, this is not the time for you to take on a really hefty payment like a car or a mortgage. At the same time, however, we already know that not everyone is going to lose their job, right? Unemployment's mm -hmm. not going to go to 100%. And so if you are someone that feels pretty confident in your ability to take on that payment, a recession is a time where you probably are going to see interest rates start to come back to earth. We're going to start to see prices start to come back to earth. Now, I should caveat this and say if mm -hmm. you're praying for a housing crash, you're probably going to be waiting for a while. Right. But this is a time that you're probably going to start to see some of those prices come down. All right. Kristen Myers, thank you so much for the balance. Really appreciate having you on Top Story. Okay, staying on the economy and that stubborn inflation, the loyalty points you earn on everything from food to hotels may be impacted as well. Now companies are starting to require more points to earn a reward. NBC's Tom Costello explains. For Americans earning reward points for every gallon of gas, rental car, airline ticket, and cup of coffee, loyalty may not be worth what it once was. As companies rewrite their reward rules, often requiring more purchases, not fewer. I'm very disappointed in Dunkin'. Dunkin' Donuts has faced a social media backlash after raising the cost of earning a free cup of coffee from $40 to $50 and doing away with free birthday drinks. There is drama in the Dunkin' world right now, tweeted one customer. I no longer run on Dunkin'. But Dunkin' says its revamped program gives customers more options and a wider variety of food and beverages. Chipotle is also requiring more purchases to earn a free burrito. P.F. Chang's now offers extra reward points for a monthly fee as inflation drives up restaurant costs, forcing many to trim expenses. We've seen it from Chipotle, we've seen it from Dunkin', we probably will see it from many others before we're all said and done. For many customers, the points make the difference. Yeah, big difference. They say they save a lot of people a lot of money. Meanwhile, you can now earn a mile on Delta Airlines for each dollar you spend at Starbucks, just as Delta will require passengers to spend more on tickets to earn top tier status and free upgrades. The advice if you've been gathering points, you don't want to hoard these just for hoarding's sake. You want to earn and burn strategically. Use them or lose them. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. Use them or lose them. All right, Tom Costello. Coming up next, an update on Brittany Griner, the American basketball star detained in Russia for more than eight months. Her message from jail tonight on her 32nd birthday. Stay with us. Back now with Top Stories Global Watch and the growing death toll in Nigeria caused by catastrophic flooding. 
Officials reporting more than 600 people have been killed and more than a million displaced since the flooding began this summer. U.N. officials citing unusually heavy rains fueled by climate change for the particularly deadly rainy season. The flooding expected to continue through November. Indonesia announcing plans to demolish the soccer stadium where more than 130 people were killed earlier this month. The stadium, which was the site of that deadly stampede, will be torn down and rebuilt according to FIFA standards. The Indonesian president vowing to improve safety protocols before the country hosts the Youth World Cup next year. And Brittany Griner is spending her 32nd birthday in a Russian jail. Monday marked eight months since the WNBA star was detained in Russia after bringing cannabis oil through Moscow's airport. She was sentenced to nine years in prison in August, which her legal team is expected to appeal next week. In a statement through her lawyers today, Griner thanked everyone for their support. And when we come back, Saving Emmanuel, TikTok's famous emu, sick with the avian flu, his road to recovery now being shared on social media. An update from Savannah Sellers on how he's doing next. Finally tonight, an update on that viral sensation you saw right here on Top Story. Emmanuel the emu, TikTok's favorite flightless bird, is now sick with the avian flu. Savannah Sellers has this report. Hey, Emmanuel, uh-uh, uh-uh, Emmanuel. He's the viral sensation that first pecked his way into our hearts this summer. Do not do it. Emmanuel, don't do it. Emmanuel. Don't do it. I'm trying to educate people right now, okay? What is the vibe of an emu? Like, is it surprising that he has this hilarious personality? The vibe is anxiety. Um, you just never really know. Now, Emmanuel Todd Lopez, as he is formally known, is fighting for his life. Caretaker Taylor Blake sharing the news on Twitter, writing, We had a massive tragedy strike the farm, and I have been doing my best to wrap my head around it. That tragedy? Avian influenza. Taylor believes the virus was likely brought to the farm by wild Egyptian geese. Is everyone hungry? In the past few weeks, almost every bird at Knucklebump Farms got sick with the virus and died, including TikTok regulars Emily, Eliza, and Elliot. But through all the loss and heartbreak, that one anxious emu fighting the virus. Emmanuel, too weak to stand on his own legs. Taylor giving him 24-hour round-the-clock care. The farm building Emmanuel this sling to help support his own weight. And now, TikTok's favorite flightless bird, showing some small signs of improvement, drinking water by himself for the first time since getting sick. Taylor asking her followers to keep Emmanuel in their prayers, posting on Twitter, the road to a full recovery will be long, but I am dedicated. No more kisses. Taylor's dedication yeah. matched by Emmanuel. Savannah Sellers, NBC News. We wish Emmanuel a full and healthy recovery. We thank Savannah Sellers for helping us with that story, and we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.